It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the Dell Alienware AW3423DW. As usual, there is a written review, and this video is just really a part of that, and you can find a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Beware that what you see on the video depends on my camera, depends on the processing done by my video editing software, depends on the processing done by YouTube, and ultimately, and very importantly, it depends on the screen that you're actually viewing the video on. So in no way does it accurately represent what the monitor looks like in person. Really, this video is just designed to give you a few nice visual examples, which help explain some of the things I go through in the written review. It doesn't have as much technical detail. If you're interested in that side of things, definitely check out the written review. And a lot of the examples I give you, they're in-game examples, some of them on the desktop. But what I'm talking about here, particularly in terms of contrast and colour reproduction, and a bit when it comes to responsiveness as well, it applies more broadly than just games. Certainly if you're watching video content or just on the desktop, it applies as well. So this monitor has a 34-inch QD OLED panel. Well, it's around 34 inches. It's I think it's 34.18 inches or something a little bit awkward like that but basically 34 inches, QD OLED, and it supports 175 hertz refresh rate. So it's a new technology. It's the first QD OLED model I've looked at. In fact, it's the first OLED monitor I've reviewed. And what QD OLED means, just briefly, is it uses an OLED light source for the blue subpixels, and the green and the red subpixels, they are formed by the use of quantum dots, which are excited by that blue OLED light source and emit very pure green and red light. So just before moving on, I do want to talk about those subpixels a little bit more because this monitor does have a bit of an unusual subpixel structure. It is RGB, red, green, and blue, but it isn't your regular red, green, and blue stripe subpixel layout. It actually has a displaced green subpixel, which you'll be able to see in this photo, which I'm just going to flash up on the screen. And I definitely recommend checking out the start of the calibration section of the written review, which runs through this in more detail, but there are some fringing issues to be aware of, or potential fringing issues. I'm going to be honest, most people aren't going to have an issue with this, most people are actually going to notice this, or if they do, it's just going to be sort of minor fringing in places, and they're not really going to care, not really going to find it bothersome. But you can notice a fringe around text and other fine edges, and that can be green, it can be red, it can be magenta, sometimes kind of golden brown, it really depends on the specific example you're looking at, and the side of the object you're looking at. The fringe is very thin, and I'm going to be honest, it's really massively exaggerated in pictures of the monitor and in videos, which is why I'm not trying to show you any specific examples here, because it's honestly a waste of time and it really just exaggerates the issue. So I'm just pointing it out here, it's something to be aware of, it will be an issue for some users, I completely understand that, but from the feedback I've seen so far, it's really a non-issue for the vast majority. I should also add that it's not something which can be eliminated by clear type. Yes, you can subjectively improve the appearance of things with clear type, kind of slightly bolden up text and that kind of thing. But as I mentioned, it's not just text which has this issue. Different fonts can show the issue in a different way. And generally, it's most notable for dark backgrounds and bright text. So think sort of browsing websites in dark mode. My own website has some content where you'll see bright text against a black background. But again, refer to the written review for a more thorough explanation and a few examples of this. The monitor has a 3440 by 1440, that's 21 by 9. If you're not familiar, this means it's like a 27 inch 2560 by 1440 WQHD or 1440p screen with extra pixels and extra space to the sides. And that does mean you have a decent amount of desktop real estate for multitasking, particularly horizontally. And by the way, I just want to add at this point, you might see some weird sort of checkerboard patterns or lines or that kind of thing on the video, particularly in the central region at the moment. I can see them on the camera's preview screen. That's just more away from the camera. It isn't something you observe on the monitor itself. So you do get a good amount of desktop real estate, particularly horizontally. So that can be good for multitasking. So you don't get kind of vertical pixel real estate that you'd get with the 4K UHD resolution, but you still get a decent amount of workspace. And of course, there's some applications. Video editing is a good example of this, where you'll have a timeline, so you have a lot of horizontal space which you can make use of. And I know some people like to have three applications open at the same time. It's fine if you do. And I would just like to point out at this point, for some reason, the camera makes the white point look like it's shifting all over the place at different points of the screen but that isn't noticed at all to the eye. Actually, the uniformity is very good to the eye, and you can see that explored in the written review in the contrast and brightness section. If you're watching video content, you can use Firefox's little picture-in-picture -picture thing. I quite like doing this myself, and that allows you to fill up a lot of the screen if it's 16 by 9 content. This is a really boring video. It's just one of my own ones. I um, don't want to get a copyright strike, so at least I know that I'm not going to get one with my own content. 
So you might have something roughly like this. It doesn't have to be exactly like that, but basically the video content fills up most of the screen. And you can have a similar effect if you're using the Netflix app I found as well. You can have a lot of the screen filled up with the video content. And then just a little bit at the side there for browsing the internet for if the video gets a bit boring. Might want to be doing something else at the same time, a little bit more exciting. So you can certainly do that. There's quite a bit of content on platforms such as Netflix, Amazon Prime, various others as well, which will take full advantage of the screen space and you'll have a screen filling experience. And that is discussed in some detail in the 3440 by 1440 article on the website. And it's summarized a bit in the written review in the ultra wide experience section there. So definitely check that out and check out the article if you're interested in this kind of thing. It also covers the game side of things. I will of course show you some games very shortly, don't worry. But basically most of them use what's called HOR plus, horizontal plus scaling. And that means that when you're using a 21 by nine screen like this, you get extra horizontal field of view whilst your vertical field of view remains the same as it would on a 16 by nine model. So basically you can see more of the game world at the sides and there's some nice photos of this monitor in action running 16 by nine and also the native 21 by nine aspect ratio to give you an appreciation of the difference this can make. And I also discuss compatibility a little bit because not all games do support this, most do. There are sometimes some issues, sometimes it's just the HUD elements rather than the game itself. Sometimes the game itself won't actually run at all at this resolution. If that's the case, you can run using scaling and you'll have black bars at the side. And that's also explored in the mission review in the interpolation and upscaling section. I'm now going to talk about the external features of the monitor. So the bottom bezel there, that's metal, so it has quite a nice feel to it. There's an Alienware logo, a bright Alienware logo in the middle there. The stand uses the Lunar Light colour scheme, or the monitor does in general, so that means it's topped with this very light grey or white looking plastic at the top. It's matte plastic, and elsewhere it uses matte black plastic. There's also a little sticker there that says NVIDIA G-Sync Ultimate, but it's just a sticker, you can remove that if you want. The top and side bezels, they are dual stage. So that means you've got a slim panel border. You can probably just about see that at the moment. That surrounds the image. And there is a hard plastic outer component. So this is a very common bezel style used for modern monitors. The screen itself, it has a glossy screen surface with a very effective anti-reflective coating to it. So if I move around, this will become clearer. So when I view this off angle, or when you view this off angle, this isn't a particularly bright room. Um, if I brighten the room up a little bit, it might be a bit clearer. So yeah, if you're viewing this off angle, then the reflections can become quite bothersome quite easily. It tends to capture a lot of light from the sides. And because of the curvature of the screen, the reflections sort of move in a weird way. They kind of seem to jump across the screen. It can get quite distracting. But from a normal viewing position, the anti-reflective properties work really well. When the screen's switched on and I'm just viewing normal content, even if it's quite dark, I don't have any issues, even if my room is reasonably bright. If it's very bright, then yes, reflections can become an issue even from a normal viewing position, but then if you have an anti-glare screen surface, you're gonna get obvious patches of glare in such conditions as well. And with a regular glossy screen surface or most glossy screen surfaces, then clearer reflections are gonna be an issue way before that. So in terms of the curvature of the screen, it has a 1800R, that's a moderate curvature. It isn't like it appears in photos and videos or it looks like it's pinching in the middle. You get used to the curve, it becomes very natural, you really forget it's there at all. So it's not something I'd worry about and actually I feel it works well on ultra wide screens like this. It just draws you in a little bit and it can potentially improve viewing comfort as well, give a more uniform viewing experience, comparing the center and the edges of the screen, bringing the edges a bit closer to your eyes. From the rear, the lunar light color scheme is in full effect so you can see the mixture of white or very light gray and black. There's also a little alien logo there. There's a ring of LEDs around the stand there as well. Obviously not illuminated at the moment. The monitor is switched off. They are alien effects lighting zones, which you can control in the OSD or using software. And I explore that in the OSD video. There's also a power LED, which you can see from the front, as well as a light bar at the bottom of the screen. Again, all explored in the OSD video and they are further alien effects lighting zones. The stand of the screen, you can see from this angle, it's pretty bulky. It's a good solid stand. It's about as solid as I've seen from a plastic stand, actually. It offers good ergonomic flexibility. You can adjust the height of the monitor. You can swivel it left and right, and you can tilt it backwards and forwards a little bit. And the exact adjustments are given in the features and aesthetics section of the written review. You can't pivot it into portrait, but it does have what they call slant adjustment, which means you can 
adjust it slightly clockwise or anti-clockwise just to straighten things up a little bit if you find it looks like it's mounted a bit wonky on the stand. You might also notice there are quite a lot of ventilation slats so around this area, also all around the screen. This does have an active cooling solution. It has two cooling fans. One of them is on all the time. The other one comes on when it's sort of high levels of cooling are needed. Every now and then it sort of spools up for a bit. I have to say, even with both of these fans on when it spools up, I don't notice it. If I'm just using the monitor on the desktop, I don't notice it either, but I don't have a silent system. My system sits under the desk, but it has air cooling and AIO cooling for the CPU. So it isn't a water cooled system. It isn't silent, but I didn't have any issues with the, the fan. I could hear it sort of when I when I got my ear in, um, I was listening to the frequencies, but it wasn't bothersome to me. It's just one of those things that's very subjective. Some people may have an issue with it, other people not so much. Obviously, it would be better if it didn't have this fan, didn't need this fan. It's very typical for models with a G-Sync Ultimate module to have this kind of cooling solution. As for the ports, they are concealed beneath this little cover, which you can slide on and off. You can see mine doesn't seem to fit properly. This could be user error, I'm not sure. I've tried to fit it a couple of times, but I always have a little gap there or on the other side, depending on how I fitted it. But this is just to neaten it up at the rear. I don't see the rear of my monitor anyway. It's facing the wall, so I don't really care about this too much. So for the ports then, you've got an AC power input, which means you've got an internal power converter. There's a quick release button there, which will allow you to detach the screen from the stand and that will reveal provision for 100 by 100 millimeter VESA mounting if you want to use an alternative mounting solution for the screen. There are then two USB 3 ports, there are two HDMI 2.0 ports and display port 1.4 and then there's a 3.5 millimeter audio output. And outside of that main port area, two further USB 3 ports, so four in total, and also a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack just for easy access. And you'll see just there, that's the light bar I was talking about. That is a touch sensitive area. So if you've got that active in the OSD, you can touch it to turn it on and off. It's not very bright though. I don't find it very useful to be honest, but it's just another lighting feature. And that little knobble there, that's the joystick. But that's all explored in the OSD video. So in terms of the capabilities of the ports, display port 1.4, that gives you the 175 Hertz refresh rate. HDMI is limited to 100 Hertz. You can use G-Sync. This model has a G-Sync module via DisplayPort or HDMI. You can also access the G-Sync module using Adaptive Sync if you have an AMD GPU using DisplayPort only. And HDR is supported via DisplayPort and HDMI, and you can use that at the same time as variable refresh rate technologies as well. And just before moving on to some gameplay, I need to talk about image retention, or burning as some people call it. I haven't had any issues with that on this monitor and QD OLED is apparently less prone to that than regular OLED technologies, at least if display manufacturer Samsung's claims are to be believed. And as I said, no issues that I had with this, so I can't report anything there at the moment, which is great. I will be keeping hold of this monitor and using it longer term. So if anything does come up, I will report that in the image retention section of the written review. So that will be updated if anything comes up. Hopefully I don't need to update it. But there are certain mitigation measures that this monitor includes and they are explored in the image retention section. So definitely check that out because it will give a much more thorough explanation than I'm about to give you here. But one thing is that it has a pixel shift algorithm and there's actually a border around the image. You might be able to see if the room is a little bit brighter than it is at the moment. I'll try and mess up the camera exposure. So there you can probably see it just between the black panel border and the edge of the image, the edge of the wallpaper. It's very thin. You can see it at the bottom as well. It surrounds the image and the image will just periodically shift left, right, up or down within that border. It seems to do this several times an hour. It shifts several times an hour. Each shift is a fraction of a second. I do actually notice this when I'm on the desktop I do sometimes notice the screen completely judder, but again, it's only a fraction of a second, then it's over, so it doesn't bother me. And I think most people should just be absolutely fine with this as well. I don't notice it at all when I'm gaming or engrossed in movie content. There are two other image retention mitigation measures. One is called pixel refresh. You'll find that under OLED panel maintenance in the OSD. You can manually run this if you want but it will automatically run after four cumulative hours of use of the monitor. So if it's been on for four hours, it will run this, but it won't run it immediately. It might do the first time. It'll give you a little message on the screen and it'll want to run it straight away, but 
there's an option then to say, don't show this message again. It won't bother you with the message and it will just run in the background when the monitor is asleep. So when the monitor's on standby or when you turn it off by pressing the power button. The power LED will then glow green to show you that it's running the cycle. It should last about seven minutes. So this is something for me which only really happens again when I'm not using the monitor. So it goes to sleep, I'm doing something else, I just leave it doing this, that's fine. Or if I go to bed and I turn the monitor off for the power button, it might do it then. So it's completely unobtrusive in my opinion. It's just something which runs in the background, you get very used to it. it just happens every now and then. And there's also a panel refresh, which is a more thorough thing. I haven't actually had this happen so far, and I wouldn't recommend manually running that because it can actually degrade the panel slightly, or from what I understand, it could potentially do that. You can manually run it if you really have to, perhaps if you've got some severe image retention that just won't go away on its own. Hopefully you won't have that, but if you do, perhaps you might want to try running that. But it will run after the monitor has been used for, I believe it's 1,500 hours. But again, if you check the image retention section of the written review, there's a more thorough explanation of all of these things. And just a final thing to be aware of with respect to the mitigation measures, this monitor doesn't use an aggressive ABL, automatic brightness limiter, under SDR, like some OLED screens do, actually many OLED screens do. So this means when you're just on the desktop, you're not going to notice these dramatic shifts in brightness depending on the brightness of the content being displayed on the screen. If there are some slight shifts, there is a gentle ABL used, so you'll see that in the contrast section of the vision review in the contrast table, I do actually give ranges for brightness. So for example, the maximum brightness I recorded was between 232 and 265 nits, and at lower brightness levels, there's less deviation, but either way, it's not something which you should re readily notice. I certainly didn't when I was just using the monitor. I wasn't really aware that it was doing it at all, except for when I specifically measured it with the colorimeter. So also be aware of the fact that it has a specified maximum luminance under SDR of 250, which slots neatly in that range there that I measured. So it's not super bright, but it is bright enough for most people. Most people will be setting it between 100 and 200 nits. I appreciate some people do just naturally like higher brightness levels, but definitely most people will be comfortable with the brightness range offered here. I'm on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm going to talk about the contrast performance of the monitor. So usually I talk a little bit about static contrast, and I might say it's 1000 to 1 or so for IPS models, perhaps 3000 to 1, a little bit higher for VA models. With this one, the static contrast is so high, it's essentially infinite, which means that the black depth is too low for my color emitter to accurately measure. It's below 0 0.01 nits. So black is really very black indeed. Also be aware, if you're not used to my videos, I do start in a dark room. I'm in a dark room right now. So I'm talking about what things look like in a dark or dimmer environment. This will become clearer very shortly. But for games like this, it really does give an excellent atmosphere, depth and atmosphere. So there's dark shades, are really nice. They're uninterrupted by any sort of glow. There's no IPS glow, no VA glow or anything like that. Now, the game isn't trying to render pure black here, so it's not gonna necessarily look like pure black here because there's actually some detail which you might not be able to see on the video, some sort of slight detail on the rocks, that kind of thing, some slight texture detail. And that's also very consistent. The gamma consistency is exceptional, so the detail levels are maintained perfectly throughout the screen, so that you don't get the kind of shifts you get with TN or VAs, where with TN you get sort of vertical shifts, VAs have central black crush and then excessive detail potentially peripherally. IPS models you get IPS glow, but they're otherwise quite consistent in terms of the gamma. But this one doesn't have any of those issues at all, so it's really nice in terms of its gamma consistency as well. So this really strong contrast, it really does help not just for darker scenes like this, but just in general, it helps give extra definition to objects because very dark shadow details, that kind of thing. Excellent depth there really helps the brighter content stand out nicely as well. And actually the strong contrast helps with medium shades as well. So there's a certain sort of purity or inkiness to these medium shades, which is typically lacking on LCD models. VA models capture this a bit, a bit better than IPS and TN, but OLED certainly brings that to another level. So these shades here, for example, it's quite difficult to describe and it's not something you can appreciate on the video, but there is definitely an extra depth to them in a good way on OLED screens like this. 
For brighter content, the glossy screen surface really helps there as well. There's no graininess from a matte screen surface, however minor that may be with some matte screen surfaces. There's no layering either, there's just nice direct emission of light. I should also mention that because of the camera exposure that just looks like a big ball of white. It's not actually like that to the eye, I should just sort of point that out. Looks a little bit more like that, but now the dark shades have become completely crushed together, which isn't the case by eye at all. I'm afraid you can't have it both ways on the video. But anyway, yes, nice direct emission of light, unimpeded by the screen surface. So I really like it in that respect. I've now brightened up the room quite a bit, and usually at this point I'd be reviewing monitors with matte screen surfaces, because that's what the vast majority use, and you would notice some glare, some patches of glare. From that, sometimes it can have some kind of slightly glassy reflections if it's bright enough and depending on the screen surface. With this one, because it's glossy, I have introduced some reflections, you can see that. There was also some direct light striking the screen surface from the side now, um, or slightly behind me. So these are not ideal conditions for any screen and you will have issues. With this one, it doesn't have an outer polarizing layer. And that means that the screen itself lightens up. If you compare the panel board of the screen, that's pure black, to the depth of the very dark shades here, you'll hopefully be able to see that they're lifted up a bit. They're more distinct from the panel border than they were before. This can be a bit difficult to appreciate in the video, but certainly by eye, the edge in contrast compared to an LCD has really been ebbed away now in these brighter viewing conditions. But don't fret, I've really shown you two extremes here. This is a rather bright room and there is some direct light striking the screen surface. You don't have to sit in a pitch black room like I was before to enjoy the strong contrast on this model. I often sit in a moderately bright room actually and I find it just fine there. It really does show nice strong contrast. But if you look at the screen surface section of the written review, I give photos and different lighting showing a black desktop background. That'll give you a really nice reference with very different lighting conditions. And I also discuss this a little bit in the contrast section there in terms of its effect on the image. But the way I see it, these brighter conditions, they're not nice for any screen surface, but I suppose there is a sort of intermediate between the dimmer room and the brighter room where perhaps another screen surface would have been preferable in terms of retaining some of that depth. But as I said, again, it's, it's a bit tricky because in brighter conditions you do invite glare, or with most glossy screens you have more distinct reflections than you can see here. So there's not really a perfect screen surface, but if they had this one plus a, an outer polarizing layer so it didn't have this kind of lightening up, that probably would have been ideal. And just a super quick addition, I'm on Legom, legom.nl, and the black levels test, and I should have really mentioned, but I prefer to use the 2.4 gamma setting in creator mode on this monitor. Now, ordinarily I wouldn't go for 2.4 gamma, but you'll see in the written review that the gamma is actually all over the place on this model. It changes depending on brightness, but the main thing that for me would spoil the regular 2.2 setting most of the time is that it actually targets a much lower gamma for very dark shades, and that means that they're brought out far too strongly. So you won't be able to see this accurately on the video, I'm gonna say right now, you can probably see that that bright box there has this heavenly glow. You don't see that to the eye, unless you have some issue with your eyes. But to the eye, the first few blocks are nicely blended. You can see even the first block faintly against the background, but that's largely because of the exceptional contrast of this OLED because the black background is truly black and it's really deep. Usually with an LCD, the black depth would be too indistinct from the first block if it's properly tracking the 2.2 gamma curve. But if I switch over to the 2.2 gamma setting, you should be able to see that the black depth is elevated and certainly to my eye, these blocks are far too distinct from the background and in fact too indistinct from one another. So I much prefer the 2.4 setting. Again, this is explored more in the calibration section of the written review. I'm back on Legom now just quickly and I'm gonna talk about color reproduction. So I'm using their tests for viewing angles and the camera for some reason shows this strange stripy banding, which you can't see to the eye. It's just, again, Moiré. It sort of comes in and out of focus a bit. Anyway, to the eye, this looks very consistent. There is green striping to the text, but it's consistent throughout. There aren't flashes of saturated red or orange or anything like that. So that indicates there's a very low viewing angle dependency to the gamma curve of the monitor. This block, as usual, doesn't really appear right on the video at all. But to the eye, 
This is a consistent and vibrant pinkish purple throughout the screen. The red block, that is a nice vibrant red throughout the screen. Consistency here is excellent, even compared to IPS type models. It's really very strong. Sometimes they will show some sort of slight darkening towards the edges, or perhaps a little bit lower down the screen, depending on the panel. But this really, to the eye, is very consistent indeed. Same with the green block, a good saturated green chartreuse throughout the screen. Again, very consistent compared to any LCD I've looked at. And I should add that IPS models are generally pretty strong in this area as well, certainly compared to VA or TN, but this model is, I'd say, another step up from that. The blue block, good royal blue throughout the screen, as it often is. I'm on Battlefield 2042 now, and I'm going to talk about the colour reproduction of the monitor. So this monitor has a generous colour gamut. I'll show that on the screen. So you can see there is significant extension beyond sRGB. It actually almost completely covers the DCI-P3 colour space. Standard content is designed with the sRGB colour space in mind, so that includes games like this. If you're just browsing the internet casually, watching something on YouTube, whatever it might be, and when you view it on a monitor with a wider colour gamut, it becomes oversaturated. And if you set the creator mode to DCI-P3, by the way, that also uses the native gamut. It doesn't clamp the gamut in any way. It's particularly generous in the red region, you can see from the gamut and this really gives excellent pop to, as you'd imagine, red shades, but also shades containing red. So the earth here, for example, has a sort of slightly rich red push or an orangey red quality to it. It's not quite as neutral as it should look. That rock even. These cones as well, they look more of a reddish orange than they should. Again, overly vibrant, oversaturated. The wood there, the palette, you get the idea. Extra saturation. The grass as well, because there's quite a bit of extension in the green region. There are some nice, quite lush looking deep greens, but a lot of the yellowish greens are brought out too strongly. I wouldn't say they look neon, so actually it doesn't take things as far as models which would have stronger Adobe RGB coverage. That's really generous in the green region. With this model, if you're interested, I measured 94% Adobe RGB coverage. So there is some missing there in the green region but it's well beyond sRGB, so you do get lots of extra saturation. And some people really like this extra saturation. Also the sky blues, I should mention, lots of pop there as well. Some people do like this look. Other people, not so much. If you prefer things to look more as the developers intend, even though that will be with the restricted sRGB color space for SDR game content like this and just general content that you consume under SDR, you can change the color space to sRGB using the creator mode of the monitor. So I've just switched that over. You can change the gamma with this as well, with the creator setting, whether you're using sRGB or DCI-P3 for your color space, so you're using the native gamma or sRGB. I'm gonna to stick to 2.4 just for consistency, because that's what I was using before with my test settings. So I'm just trying to show you or talk about the difference that the color gamut alone makes. But if you're interested in the difference that the gamma makes, the gamma setting as well, and also a more specific look at the effect of the gamut as well as gamma, then check out the Spider Checker 24 section of the written review. There are some really nice visual examples of all of that there. But you can see, hopefully in the video you can even see this, things are a lot more subdued now, things look more natural, more as the developers intend. You don't get the extra pop, for example, these cones now look more of an orange than a red, or a slightly reddish orange, but much less red than they did before. The red there looks sort of a more of a faded red, less extra pop than there was before, and the grass and the vegetation looks quite natural as well. Some of it doesn't look as lush or rich as it did before, but that was partly due to some oversaturation as well. But certainly the yellowish greens are suitably toned down now. And the sky blue as well, not as vibrant. So this is an effective sRGB emulation mode. It clamps the gamut close to sRGB, and I'll just show you that on the screen now. So if you wanted to use this monitor for not just consuming content, but actually creating content, a few things to be aware of. I've already mentioned that the gamma handling is really odd, and because of that, I would definitely recommend calibrating this if you can with a colorimeter or similar device, the highest level of accuracy. But because the gamma curve is kind of pretty wonky, you might find that some banding is introduced or there's a slight loss of shade variety in places. This might not be an issue depending on the kind of content you create and what level you're creating it at, but it is something to be aware of. So even if you fully calibrate this monitor using an ICC profile, so you're fully profiling it like that, 
then there can be some residual issues there. But with the colour space support, you get excellent DCI-P3 coverage, excellent sRGB coverage, and decent, but not amazing, Adobe RGB coverage. So there's quite a lot of flexibility in that respect. I'm back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I'm running the monitor under HDR high dynamic range. Be aware that I'm using an RTX 3090, an NVIDIA RTX 3090, connected via DisplayPort, but I have tested this using HDMI, which is how you'd be connected up if you're using a compatible games console. Just be aware that with the Xbox Series X, you have to have a 4K signal to use HDR, but this monitor doesn't support that. That isn't a stipulation with the PS5, though, so you could use HDR on the PS5 for this one, but clearly it's an ultra-wide monitor. It's more designed for PC gaming, but if you want to use it for games consoles as a secondary use, of course you can, but you will be restricted to 16x9 resolution, so you'll be having black borders at the ends of the screen. I also tested with HDMI and DisplayPort using an AMD GPU, and I found the experience much the same with all of these different connections and different GPUs, so very uniform in that respect. Be aware that you can also use VRR at the same time, variable refresh rate technologies such as G-Sync or FreeSync via Adaptive Sync at the same time as HDR as a PC user. So the OSD options are quite restricted under HDR. I should say they're somewhat restricted, actually. A little bit more flexibility than you have with some models. So see the preset mode creator, or you might be able to see in the video, it might be a bit overexposed, but creator's actually greyed out, but that's what I was using before under SDR. The reason it's greyed out is because they don't want you to change the gamma, and they don't want you to change the colour gamut, or the, the colour space setting, under HDR. And that's what you can access with the creator setting, so that's why they've greyed it out. It's still using that, but the experience is exactly the same if you select standard, if you've got it set to creator, if you select game one, game two, game three, or custom color, but you can manually adjust the red, green, and blue color channels if you wish using custom color, or with game one and game two, or game three. Just be aware that with game one, game two, game three, this is set to 50% by default, that's your neutral point. And if you want to make some adjustments here under HDR, feel free. What I'd say though is don't make massive adjustments. Really things will start deviating far too far from the intended HDR metadata if you do that. You can also use the other presets like FPS, MOBA slash RTS, RPG and Sports, but again, they deviate far too far from the metadata and give a very undesirable look to the image, so I would not recommend them. And as you can see, the brightness is locked out, or hopefully you can see that the brightness is locked out, so that is automatically controlled under HDR. And a relevant setting with this in mind, really the main setting you want to be changing is HDR mode. So there are two options there, HDR 400 True Black, which follows the VESA certification for that level, not to be confused with VESA Display HDR 400, this is a very different level to that, and HDR Peak 1000, which allows the monitor to pump out higher brightness for smaller bright shades. So in terms of the differences between these two modes, I'm using HDR Peak 1000 at the moment, and what I can see is when there's a relatively small amount of brightness, so for the daylight there, that's really nice and bright, it has a very natural look to it. Meanwhile, because of the per pixel illumination, the dark shades and the medium shades, they have appropriate depth as well. It's really nice in that respect. When I move out so the bright shades are dominating, or dominating a bit more, the ABL, Automatic Brightness Limiter, kicks in. And you can see the exact measurements in the vision review in the contrast table there. So how bright the monitor is going to get does depend on how much of the screen is dominated by these bright shades, and it does dim quite significantly when there's a lot of bright shades. And it's not just the bright shades that dim. I can actually see some changes with the medium shades there for the wall, for example. They become dimmer when a lot of this bright content's displayed, and they do brighten up quite a bit when it's predominantly darker content being displayed. I will come back to this shortly, but I'm just going to switch to the HDR True Black 400 setting. This gives a more consistent experience, but the peak brightness is significantly lower. So where I measured a peak luminance of 1059 with the HDR 1000 setting, or peak HDR 1000, with this one, it'll go up to a maximum of 458. And there is an automatic brightness limiter, ABL, as well with this setting, but it doesn't make the same kind of adjustments. HDR True Black setting, some people might prefer it because it's more consistent. And yes, you can see all sorts of shifts on the video, but that's just the camera adjusting there. To the eye, it's a lot more consistent because it doesn't have that aggressive ABL with huge differences depending on the levels of brightness on the screen. So some people may prefer this. 
Personally, I prefer the extra pop that the HDR Peak 1000 setting can give. And again, I'm going to explore this with some more specific examples shortly. So I'm just going to switch over to that setting and I'm going to use that for most of the rest of this section of the review. Another advantage of HDR, so it's HDR10 that's supported here, as is the case with most monitors, is that it allows 10-bit colour reproduction to be leveraged. And this monitor does support that on the monitor itself at 144Hz and below. If you're running it at 175Hz, then there is a dithering stage which is offloaded to the GPU. You don't have to worry about that though. The GPU dithering, it's used for bandwidth reasons, but visually it's, it's really indistinguishable from with the monitor handling everything itself. I've tested this on many monitors before, not just this one, and I've really just came to the same conclusion there. I know artings or ratings.com They've done some specific gradient testing with this as well, and they've come to the same conclusion. Not with this specific model, they haven't looked at that just yet, but just with other models, and that really does show that the GPU dithering works very well indeed under HDR. So it's not something you have to worry about, just use 175 Hz if you want to. There are other advantages as well to the 10-bit color reproduction, and they come with the brighter shades. So there are plenty of them in this scene I'm about to show you here. I still do like this scene, Still one of my favourites for showcasing good versus bad HDR performance, and this is firmly in the good camp here. So that glint there, this isn't to do with the 10-bit reproduction, but that really does catch my eye straight away. It really does make use of those nice high brightness levels with the Peak HDR 1000 setting. The light streaming in from above as well has a quite a nice quality to it. And also it doesn't just appear like a big ball. So the 10-bit colour reproduction also helps smooth out gradients at the high end. So what I was showing you before with the dark shades, that gives you kind of an uplift of detail, a natural uplift of detail. For these brighter shades, it gives you smoother gradients, more natural look to things, smoother progressions of shade. It's all very nice. So it looks a little bit more like that to the eye. Uh, but again, it's not an HDR video. You can't actually see what you'd see by eye. And because of the Perpix illumination, it can show these excellent bright shades alongside these darker shades. So really nice depth to the shadow detailing there amongst the vegetation and the rocks, little cracks and stuff in the rocks, those kind of small details, really nice appropriate look there. And the medium shades, they have good depth as well, often under HDR if it's an LCD, especially if it doesn't have many dimming zones. I'll often point out that things look a bit flooded. It doesn't look like that at all here. I'm on Battlefield 5. I'm again running under HDR. Now this is a scene, I just want to show you this quickly, this is a scene where the ABL really does kick in quite heavily. And this is a scene which was extremely eye-catching when I was testing it on the ASUS PG32UQX. It really stuck in my mind as an incredibly impressive show of brightness. With this model, it really doesn't do that at all, and that's because of the ABL. It does still have decent brightness. It doesn't look dim, don't get me wrong. But with the Asus, I could see the sun there, for example, and all of these glints on the snow, they were extremely impressive, and there was a sort of really natural glow to the silver lining of the clouds. With this model, you don't get that at all, and that's because of the ABL. So really, in scenes like this, it's not super impressive. In fact, even if I was in a brighter room with the Asus, it had incredible pop to it, and really it's because of the fact it could sustain 1,200 nits, actually a little bit above that, even for a full white window. Of course, this isn't a full white window. It really doesn't have the same kind of ABL limitations as this model. I should point out, though, that most OLED technologies have a more aggressive ABL than this. This is actually really impressive in terms of its luminance for an OLED model, but mini LED LCDs, they do still have some advantages here. To disorient you a bit more, I'm now on Cyberpunk 2077. Again, I'm running the monitor under HDR. I'm actually using the HDR 400 True Black setting just at the moment, just to start off with. And I just want to show you, or at least talk about the fact that things are very consistent here. Again, there's a decent brightness, but it's not particularly impressive. Things do dim a little bit when I'm showing you a lot of the bright sky here, but it's not a dramatic shift. And also be aware that I have calibrated the game correctly for this luminance level. Although, regardless of what you do there, it doesn't change the fact that things aren't super impressive in terms of brightness and there aren't massive shifts either. I'm now running with the HDR Peak 1000 setting and the brightness is quite a bit more impressive in some respects. So when I'm looking at those small lights over there, for example, to the right, and also when there's just a little bit of that daylight shown, it really has an impressive bloom. And again, it's more detailed than it appears in the video. It just kind of overwhelms the camera a bit, overexposes things. But that's really impressive, the brightness there. If I shift up so more of the sky is visible, 
then the ABL kicks in. And again, it's not just the bright shades that affect, it affects the medium shades. The concrete on that wall, for example, does become dimmer. And you may not find these shifts bothersome, you might not notice them so much, but it definitely does limit how impactful the bright shades are when, there's a lot, when there are a lot of bright shades on the screen. You can also see with the HUD elements, there's sort of a, a dimming and brightening. They're much brighter now, for example, than they are now. Just to give you an example, I think you get the idea at this point. But if I sounded like I was moaning before, sounded like I was a little bit down on the HDR performance of this model, that really wasn't the takeaway I was going for. I just wanted to point out some of the limitations. But scenes like this really do show off the capabilities of the monitor fantastically well. I'm not saying that Cyberpunk is necessarily the best HDR implementation. You can get some mods apparently that will change this, but by default, the black levels aren't super deep. Actually, they, they are sometimes in, in some interior locations, but in scenes like this, the, the black depth is somewhat limited, so you don't get the incredible contrast of the screen really shown off in full effect. However, it definitely does highlight its peak luminance capabilities with the HDR1000 setting. So the moon up there, it's actually very detailed by the way. I can see all the details on the moon. It doesn't just look like a giant bright blob like it does there. It looks a bit more like... I'm afraid I can't show it with the camera because it's still too bright. But never mind, you'll just have to take my word for it. It doesn't look like a giant bright ball in the sky. But it definitely is bright, definitely eye-catching. All of these neon lights as well, really eye-catching. So it does give a really dynamic look to things in that respect. It's really nice and it definitely allows the monitor to show off its peak luminance, which is actually quite a bit beyond what most OLED screens will display. In fact, even if the room's moderately bright, it has quite good pop to these bright elements. Yes, they're most impactful in a dark or dimmer room, but even with moderate brightness, I often play this game in the daylight and a few other games under HDR in the daylight. And I find it pretty good there. Again, not as impressive as something like the ASUS model and some of the really powerful mini LED backlight solutions, but certainly decent in that respect. I'm now back on Shadow of the Tomb Raider just to disorient you further on a different scene. I want to talk about the colour performance primarily, and that's another important aspect of HDR. So as I showed you earlier, this monitor offers excellent DCI-P3 coverage, and that's put to full effect under HDR. So rather than sRGB being the target gamut there, DCI-P3 is the sort of nearer term target gamut for HDR content, and in the longer term developers will have Rec 2020 in mind. According to the specifications of this model, it offers around 80% Rec 2020 coverage, so really it's, it's closer to DCI-P3 than Rec 2020, but this does allow it to show nice levels of saturation, so there's a nice richness to these green shades, for example, and the greens of Lara's dress here, and those red pillars as well show really nice vibrancy. So there are plenty of shades here, well beyond the sRGB colour space. Another nice thing is that the monitor is able to sustain these high levels of saturation with high luminance at the same time. That's something which some OLED models struggle with, those with an WRGB subpixel layout. So they have a white subpixel which is used for the higher brightness and that starts flooding the image. It sort of dilutes the image, dilutes the colour gamut. So that is to say that the colour volume is better in this respect than some of those alternative OLED designs. So the gold here I know it looks a bit sort of whitish on the video, and again, you can't really appreciate any of this on the video, but to the eye, it's probably the best I've actually seen this particular gold. It is incredibly lifelike, realistic gold. It has a nice brightness to it, really nice saturation, very impressive in that respect. More of those elements here as well. What I would say is, again, I do have to compare to the mini LED solutions. Some of them do have a wider color gamut than this, and although this game like most HDR content at the moment, it will be targeted in DCI-P3. Sometimes monitors use a little bit of artistic license and actually use some of their gamut beyond that. Some models do have greater coverage in the green to blue edge of the gamut, so they'll have better Adobe RGB coverage, they'll also have better Rec 2020 coverage, at least in that part of the gamut. And that does add a little bit of extra richness and extra vibrancy to some of these shades. So some of these greens, I have seen them looking a bit more saturated than they do here on, for example, the ASUS PG32UQX. But I have to say, you're not going to look at this monitor under HDR and think it looks washed out at all or anything but vibrant. It really does look vibrant, nice saturation, and coupled with the exceptionally strong contrast, it really does give a nice look to things. And because the developers are targeting these wider colour spaces, it means that things are appropriately muted where they should be. So Laura's skin tone, the skin tone of various other characters as well, 
appropriately muted, it doesn't have that kind of red push. Same with the woody tones and the earthy browns. They're nice and neutral as well, they don't have the red push. And the yellowish greens aren't overdone either, so there's a really nice deep lush look to some of these greens. And the yellowish greens aren't overdone, as they are under SDR, where the sRGB colour space is targeted. So whilst, yes, there is technically some room for improvement in terms of its HDR performance, it's not perfect. I think it would be quite dull as a monitor review if it was, because then, you know, what can you expect in the future? This definitely does have a very nice dynamic HDR performance, and it's one which many people are going to be extremely pleased with. I'm on Battlefield 5 now, and I'm going to talk about the responsiveness of the monitor. This monitor has a 175Hz refresh rate. I've got the monitor running at a solid 175Hz and the game 175 frames a second. You can see the frame rate in the top right, or hopefully you can see that little green number there, 175. So the monitor is pumping out nearly three times as much information as a 60Hz monitor, or indeed this monitor set to 60Hz. This brings a couple of advantages. One is that it improves the connected feel, and that describes the fluidity and the precision you feel when interacting with the game world. Input lag is also an important metric to consider there. This model has fairly low input lag. I measured a little bit above five milliseconds, so it's not actually super low. And to be fair, it's not quite as low as I've seen on most models with a G-Sync module, which this does have. But it isn't such a high level that most people are going to have any issues here at all. It's still going to feel very fluid. And as I'll come on to very shortly, visually it is very fluid. So I don't think this is going to be disappointing to most people at all. The other aspect of the high frame rate, high refresh rate combination is that it greatly reduces perceived blur due to eye movement. And this is all explored in the written review and also an article on the website all about responsiveness. So definitely check that out if you're not familiar with this term. There's also an exploration of pursuit photography there. And this is a nice way of capturing motion on a monitor. And I'm going to show you some pursuit photographs on this model, taking at 175 hertz. There's more context given in the written review in the responsiveness section and also testing at various different refresh rates. So again, definitely check that out. So what you can see here is essentially a visually flawless performance in terms of pixel responses. Even compared to the reference displays, I picked two reference displays there. One was the Gigabyte M27Q. The reason I picked that is because it's a moderate performer. It performs fairly well, a reasonably fast IPS model. It's at a level that most people are very comfortable with. The XV323U GP is a fast IPS model, so that really does perform well, but even then there are some slight weaknesses, and I often talk about these weaknesses in my videos, even when I'm reviewing fast IPS models. I'll talk about just a little bit of powdery trailing in places, I'll talk about perhaps a little bit of overshoot in places, or it could be more distinct weaknesses depending on the model. But here, there's just nothing of that sort. Something which isn't really captured on the camera, but there are actually little internal details on those UFOs, these little white blobs. Usually you can't see them, they're on the body, and usually you can't see them by eye, you can't count them, unless there's a strobe backlight setting or similar on the monitor. So if it's using its normal sample and hold operation with an LCD, even one with a high refresh rate than this, you'd usually not be able to count those. So I haven't been able to count them even on 360 hertz models using the default speed of the test. So with this one, it really actually impressed me the fact that you could see those distinctly, you could count them at 175 hertz. And that's because there isn't even the most minor mask of perceived blur from pixel response weaknesses. And how does that translate into game performance? Well, it also means that there is some very fine dark shades or bright shades intermingled with contrasting shades near them, which will produce just a little bit of perceived blur on even fast IPS models, for example. But with this one, there's just no weakness at all there. So it does give just an extra level of clarity and any perceived blur you see is due to your eye movement. This monitor doesn't have a strobe, well, it will be a pixel strobing setting. It doesn't have a backlight, but it doesn't have any sort of pixel strobing setting or black frame insertion or anything like that. ULMB, for example, nothing like that. So you can't reduce the perceived blur any further, but it's really still at a level which most people are going to be very happy with. And of course, you don't have to worry about the downsides of the strobe backlight setting, no strobe crosstalk, flickering, no limitations to the brightness you can use, that kind of thing. I'm now on a different scene on Battlefield 5, and this scene has plenty of high contrast transitions, so there are lots of darker shades with contrasting brighter shades or medium to bright shades. And these kind of transitions, even fast LCDs, sometimes have some weaknesses, be it overshoot or powdery trailing, that kind of thing. But with this, again, the pixel responses are just perfect. 
so absolutely optimal 175 hertz performance here no weaknesses at all from the pixel responses So I'm just going to move straight on to talking about VRR, variable refresh rate. And if you're not aware of what VRR technologies do, it does mean that as the frame rate of your content changes, I'll just increase the graphics settings so this is a little bit more relevant. So even with the slightest fluctuations of frame rate, you can see tearing if you've got VSync disabled, or you can see stuttering if you've got VSync enabled. And to someone like me, this is obvious, even on a 175Hz monitor, and with this one, the pixel responses are so strong that even the slightest stuttering really does stand out in an obvious way, in my opinion. So it's nice to have those interruptions removed from frame rate and refresh rate mismatches. There can still be stuttering for other reasons. It doesn't get rid of issues with the game engine or if your CPU has some limitations or your memory, that kind of thing. There are all sorts of things that can cause stuttering. This is just getting rid of the stuttering from frame and refresh rate mismatches. This monitor has a G-Sync module, as I mentioned before. What this means is it has a very broad range of operation. It is specified as 1 to 175 hertz, although technically there is a crossover point. When it goes below 15 hertz, it will double the frame rate, a bit like low frame rate compensation, or LFC, as AMD calls it. So if your content is at 14 frames a second, the monitor will be 28 hertz. That does keep tearing and stuttering at bay as well. So it's not like an adaptive sync model where you usually have an LFC boundary of 48 hertz. It can vary depending on the model, but it's usually 48 hertz, 48 frames a second. You go below that, there's momentary stuttering. And this is very slight stuttering, not everyone will detect it, but it isn't there at all in this case. I also often talk about variable overdrive, which is something which models with a G-Sync module like this use, but that's not relevant with OLEDs because they don't need to use aggressive pixel overdrive at all. They're just natively extremely fast anyway, so that's not an issue even if this didn't have a G-Sync module. You can also access the G-Sync module as an AMD user. So I'm using an RTX 3090 at the moment, but I tested with an RX 580, and I was able to use Adaptive Sync or FreeSync with my AMD GPU via DisplayPort, and that provided a very similar experience to G-Sync. It's just an alternative way of accessing the G-Sync module, so you get all of the features and all of the functionality there. There are still some slight advantages to the fact this does have a G-Sync module. I know people will often think, well, what's the point in having a G-Sync module and an OLED at all? Some people, and I would include myself in this, have noticed that there's a little bit of micro stuttering that occurs on adaptive sync models, particularly with G-Sync compatible mode, but you can notice it, or I have noticed it a little bit with AMD FreeSync as well. With the G-Sync module, things are just a little bit more fluid in that respect. There's just less micro stuttering. If you look at the G-Sync experience section of the written review, I link to a forum post where I discuss this a little bit more. I have to say it's anecdotal. There's nothing super scientific here. It's something which I've heard a few other people mention. It's just something that I've anecdotally noticed myself. So I just thought it's worth bringing that up. However, one thing I personally hope that the G-Sync module might be able to address would be VRR flickering. So there are slight gamma changes which occur for darker to medium dark shades in a variable refresh rate environment, which can manifest as slight flickering for dark to medium dark shades. This is a specific test to show this. You can see that the refresh rate is fluctuating all over the place and that's what will trigger this kind of behavior. You can see these gamma shifts for dark to medium dark shades. What I would say though is it doesn't affect all shades, so it isn't something which is as widespread as on some VA models, where they'll have flickering due to voltage sensitivities as well, which can cause more widespread issues. But this is just these gamma changes which occur in the VRR environment. On most IPS LCDs, you wouldn't be able to see this at all because the contrast simply isn't strong enough, or TNs for that matter, because the contrast typically isn't strong enough, so it'll just completely mask this and you wouldn't be able to see these kind of changes anyway. Now, this test, it's great for showing it off. When you're gaming, you don't always notice this. It's just specific scenes if you have heavy fluctuations in frame rate and there's dark enough content. With my RTX 3090, the frame rate was generally quite stable, so I wasn't really able to show you this very easily, but I did notice it in loading scenes and in game menus as well when I was in game, and I did sometimes see it in game as well, it just didn't happen to be recording at the times. It's just easier to show you with this test. So yeah, I would have liked to have seen the G-Sync module tune things a bit more carefully here. But as I mentioned more broadly, this model does have some quite quirky gamma behavior anyway. So really that might be a step too far expecting perfection in that respect. And just a, a final thing to note with relation to that, you might find that your frame rate is fluctuating around 100 to 175 Hertz quite a bit. 
If you reduced your refresh rate to 100 hertz or used a frame rate limiter, then you would get rid of that fluctuation. So if you are finding the flickering bothersome, the VRR flickering, then that is something you could consider. Most people shouldn't find this too bothersome. It, it just depends on the games you play and the fluctuations that are occurring, but you might want to look into a frame rate limiter if you are finding it bothersome. To wrap up then, the design of the monitor, it's quite nice if you like the sort of sci-fi film prop design, the monochromatic design. I do quite like it myself, but I know it's very subjective. Good ergonomic flexibility as well. The curve of the screen works with the ultra-wide aspect ratio, I feel. It's something which is very natural. The resolution itself, good amount of desktop real estate horizontally, field of view advantages to certain movie content and games as well. In terms of the contrast performance, very strong indeed particularly if you're in a dimmer room. In a brighter room, the edge and contrast it has compared to your LCDs, that does get eaten away a bit. And in particularly bright room, and especially if there's bright direct light striking the screen surface, it's really difficult to see that it is an OLED at all in terms of its black depth or depth to dark shades. So it is best enjoyed in dimmer lighting environments, but I use this plenty in, in moderately bright room or a reasonably dim room rather than a pitch black room and I find the contrast experience excellent there. The monitor does have some quirks to be aware of. It has a cooling fan, I know that kind of bothers some people. It has these mitigation measures to try to avoid image retention. I didn't have any issues with image retention. As I mentioned, I will be keeping this longer term and I will be updating the written review, the image retention section there, if I do come across anything. But I've used this for about a month now and I haven't had any particular issues there. And it really just runs its little mitigation measures automatically. They're largely just running in the background. You don't really think too much about any of that. The other quirk surrounds the subpixels. So it's RGB, but it's not regular RGB stripe layout. And that does cause some fringing issues, which I would stress again that most people aren't going to find bothersome. And I'm afraid they're very badly represented in pictures and videos of the monitor, greatly exaggerated. So it's really something you'd have to view by eye or try and read detailed subjective accounts like I've given in the written review. For the colour performance, very vibrant. And the screen surface as well, the glossy screen surface sort of helps in that respect as well. But it provides a highly saturated and vibrant look to SDR content, which is typically designed with the sRGB colour space in mind. So there will be oversaturation. It's a look some people like. If not, there is an sRGB emulation setting. Another quirk of this monitor is related to the gamma, sort of all over the place. It varies with brightness as well. So quite inconsistent in that respect. For general consumption, I wouldn't say this is an issue. But if you are needing the highest level of accuracy, then I would advise profiling the monitor there. The HDR performance of the monitor was very impressive as well, not just in terms of the colour output, but certainly in terms of the contrast and the brightness output as well. There were some limitations, so where there were lots of brighter shades visible on the screen, the ABL kicked in quite significantly. And certainly if you're comparing the peak luminance levels to the luminance levels where a lot of bright content is displayed, there are definitely some limitations there. But where there are smaller bright areas, then it really did give a nice pop to them. And the excellent contrast as well really helps with the dark shades. 10-bit colour reproduction, the usual kind of advantages, came into play very nicely, coupled with the per-pixel illumination. For the responsiveness of the monitor, fairly low input lag, not as low as I've seen on some models, particularly those with G-Sync modules, but low enough that most people will be absolutely fine with this aspect. And it just put in a visually flawless sample and hold 175Hz performance, visually very fluid indeed. It might be nice to see a pixel strobe setting, ULMB or something like that, for those who like that kind of thing, to give an extra edge in terms of minimising perceived blur but that wasn't an option here. VRR worked well as well, variable refresh rate. There was some flickering in certain scenes for dark to medium dark shades under heavy fluctuation. But aside from that, it worked very well. So overall, I personally thoroughly really enjoyed using this monitor and I'm gonna keep hold of it for my own sort of enjoyment, consuming movie content and game content under both SDR and HDR. It is a difficult one to get hold of though. I think it's priced well for the performance on offer and it delivers something which no other ultra wide does. I know some people might be cross shopping with other OLED models at the moment. That would be OLED TVs. 42 inch would be the smallest size at the moment. I don't cover TVs, so I haven't used any of those. So I don't want to give a technical comparison. 
but there are some potential improvements with the QD OLED in terms of reduced chance of image retention and also better brightness performance with less aggressive ABL under both STR and HDR. So the way I see it, even if you can't get hold of this one or it doesn't quite tick your boxes, it's a really nice demonstration of QD OLED technology and some of the screens we can look forward to in the future in various different resolutions and screen sizes. If you do like the 34 inch ultra wide experience and you can get hold of this one and you're also not bothered by the quirks I've mentioned, then you're really likely to very much enjoy the experience offered here. So that's really all of us too, the Dell Alienware AW3423DW. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how I can support the work that we do.